All right. Well, let's, why don't we get started? First of all, thanks uh, for coming to the session. Um, so we're going to be talking about what kind of workloads you want to do in a cloud platform, rather to be uh, particular, obviously in this case, for a cloud stack. Um, and we're going to be talking about basically the, the two primary types of workloads that we see today when uh, users talk about wanting to go to the cloud. So a couple of introductions. Aaron, do you want to? Sure, absolutely. So I'm Aaron Delp. Um, slight change from the program. Uh, I was recently employed by Citrix. Um, as of Monday, I started actually at SolidFire, cloud solutions architect there. Um, I'll be working on uh, cloud stack solutions and how they integrate with the arrays going forward. And um, Ken doesn't know this, but uh, we've got a little drinking game since it's the morning, it'll be coffee. Anytime Ken accidentally says OpenStack instead of CloudStack, you have to take, you know, take a sip of coffee. Right. Because that happened <laughs> yesterday all day. So my name is Kenneth Hoy. I'm a technology evangelist with Rackspace. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Rackspace is actually the, one of the two companies that helped found the OpenStack project. So obviously my focus is on OpenStack. Um, but the CloudStack uh, Collaboration Conference Committee was gracious enough to, to have me come and to talk not about OpenStack, but talk about cloud computing in general. Because I think that's, that there's a lot of obviously similarities and synergies between what both of our communities are trying to do in terms of helping end users kind of go to the next level in their IT as a service um, deployment. So let's talk about these two workloads. So a good place to start is to think, it's, it's kind of odd, right? Um, it's, it's 2014 and all of a sudden virtualization, is not, I would consider it almost legacy. So when, when I talk about virtualization, I'm talking specifically about technologies like vSphere or Zen, uh, the Zen hypervisor or KVM, right, or Hyper-V. So hi virtualization uh, is hypervisor technology that abstracts uh, particularly the, the physical serv the, um, sorry, the, op the servers from the physical server so that, you, um, so that instead of being restricted to one instance of an operating system sitting on a physical server, you can have multiple sometimes up to 20 to 100 on a single physical server, depending on how large that server is. Um, and obviously, we've kind of taken that now to apply that to networking and storage. So the thing to think about with this workload is virtualization kind of came to being, right, around the, with very legacy types of application workloads. Think Oracle, think uh, Microsoft Exchange, right, where, where the application sat probably on one server and one server only, Right? If you wanted to grow the application, you either uh, just added more memory and more, and more storage, or you just create a second instance of that server somewhere else. Um, and, and the point of it was to try to, again, to consolidate that workload. And what we found over time was it was actually great to marry virtual, virtual, uh, hypervisor technologies with shared storage. Because, again, you could consolidate the data as well. So those are the type of workloads that virtualization was kind of designed for. It was also designed for the, um, virtual workloads where you expect it, it would never go away, right? So we have, I used to do a lot of VMware work, and we would have customers that would have an Oracle server running on a VM that they, they never shut off, right? Except for, uh, you know, upgrades that require some kind of a shutdown of the application. And it was also very operator focused, right? This idea that, if a developer wanted resources, compute resources, you had to fill out a spreadsheet or make open a ticket, right? And then we wait six weeks to a month, or sometimes six months to get your resource. I had a customer recently that uses uh, VMware uh, through a service provider, and the SLA for them to get a, a, virtual, a VM to know to do development was for six weeks. And one of the great things about virtualization was it initially started as a consolidation play, but people realized, well, if, I could, if I'm consolidating all these VMs onto a physical server, and I'm also consolidating the data so it's sitting on a shared storage, I, I could actually do some really cool things with that technology. Things like being able to do um, VM mobility and high availability. So the idea of being able to, uh, when a VM that's running, an, say, an Oracle application fails, I can just bring it up on another server that sees the same storage. Right, and that was a, a boon because it was for, for very monolithic applications like Oracle and Exchange, it was, it was very difficult to make it highly available. 
very difficult to move that workload around. And virtualization kind of enabled that to happen. And there's various consumption models. So these are different hypervisors, for example. There's obviously many more that supports virtualization. And then you can also actually outsource that virtualization to various companies, right, that do managed virtualization hosting. But then around 2007 or so, right, Amazon released AWS. And that was a complete, completely new way of looking at how infrastructure should be rolled out and how applications should be designed. So in a cloudy world, which is the other workload that we want to talk about, right, you should see here, it's, not only is it not share storage, right, but the data, the data for an application doesn't necessarily sit on one server anymore. In fact, it's distributed across many, many servers. Right? And the workload tends to be very spiky. So you think uh, a canonical example would be Netflix, right, where on Christmas Day, they may practically double the number of virtual machines that they run during other times of the year and then tear that down as soon as the Christmas holidays are over. Uh, it's, and also it was, there was a focus not on the operator but on the developer, right? This idea that developers should have control over the infrastructure via APIs. So instead of having to, again, go through an operator to ask for a resource, they spin it up themselves, right? And they can uh, control how, how much resources they need, when they need it, and tear it down when they don't need it anymore. And because of that, the way that uh, cloudy, that cloudy application was designed, right, we assumed that the infrastructure would fail. So one of the things that, one of the questions I get all the time when, I'm, when I talk to customers, particularly customers who are uh, either VMware customers or Zen Send Server customers, is the, one of the top questions they want to know is, if I move over to, let's say, Cloud Stack or OpenStack, what happens when my application fails? When that VM fails, do I, does it automatically restart? And usually the answer is no, right? Which, you should respond to this question. What the heck is wrong with cloud computing platforms? For, that they can't do a, such a basic uh, functionality of virtualization, which is to automatically fail over and move the VM. And, the, and what I try to tell them is, this is that's not a failing of the cloud platform, but rather is a, is a difference in philosophy of design. So when it comes to cloud, whether it's, again, whether it's cloud stack or open stack, the focus here is to, for rapid scale, right? This idea that it's, it's not about being able to provision a, a single VM every few weeks. It's being able to provision thousands, tens of thousands of VMs within minutes and be able to tear them down again and, and repurpose them when needed. And the idea is to be able to grow, grow that environment so when you have that spike uh, in, your in your business, right, you, you're, not, uh, you're able to spin up those resources as the demand uh, rises and without having to take any type of downtime or have you, your customers experience um, lags. The problem, or the, or the reality though, is when you do things at scale, things fail, and they fail all the time, right? If you think about it, it's, it's one thing to have, say, 50 VMs, 100 VMs in an environment running on maybe 10 or 20 servers. What do you do when you have 100,000 VMs or even 10,000 VMs sitting on 100 servers with using a, a, all using share or a bunch of different storage? At some point, something's going to fail, right? Even if you're using the best hypervisor technology in the world, something will fail. And something will, or the storage might fail, uh, a networking equipment could be misconfigured, but something will fail at all times. And so instead Here, of... Real quick on that, Ken. Yeah. Um, and a, an analogy to think about, too, of that, and even not related necessarily to cloud computing, but just systems in general. Yeah. Um, so, so way, way, way back when, even pre-virtualization, I actually did benchmarking for IBM for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And every system, physical, virtual, no matter what, has a weak point. It has a failure point. And, and when you're trying to make things go faster or scale out, basic benchmarking and scalability is finding that weak point and moving, <coughs> excuse me, moving that point just a little bit further and finding the next one and moving that one a little bit further, right? Everything will fail at scale at some point. It's just making it to the users and the business 
moving those scales out just far enough right. to where they don't see it. And, and so when you hear some people say, oh, it's not as scalable as this, it's not scalable as that, at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, but if you don't see it, does it matter? Right. Right. <laughs> so that's something to always think about in this when, when people talk about things such as, you know, scalability or going fast, you know, how do you go faster, how do you grow out more? It, sometimes the answer is just enough. It isn't, I have to be this, right? Sometimes all I have to be is this. So I just want to add that in. Yep. So, so the key with building cloudy or architecture for cloudy nat or cloud native applications is not to try to design it in such a way that n things never, your infrastructure never fails. The way to design it, which is the way virtualization uh, design was done, but in a cloud world, cloudy world, the focus is to say, I assume my infrastructure will fail, and how do I design around it? So that when that infrastructure fails, my users don't see the impact. So a couple of principles to follow. One is this whole idea of, of catalysts versus pets, right? In the virtualization world, you know, when a VM fails, you spend a lot of time trying to fix it. But in a cloud world where uh, you, and we'll talk about this later, where you're distributing that application across many servers, don't, don't spend a lot of time trying to fix any one cloud instance, server instance. Basically shoot it and move on. Right? The idea is we, want, we don't want to, quote unquote, waste time trying to fix a server or try to make it perform better. Just replace it with something else and just keep moving. And to make that happen, the key is not to, not to try to scale up, try to build bigger and better server. The key is to make a bunch of smaller servers. So distribute your application and your, your, t your services across many, many servers, and just keep growing those as you go. Right? So for a, a good canonical example is uh, in, a, in a web environment. Right? You don't want to create a bunch of big web servers and try to scale them up. You just create many, many smaller web servers with low balances across them. And then when, you, when user requests spike up, just spin up more web instances instead of trying to make your existing web instances perform better. So the key is to create what we call a share nothing message based architecture. So remember going back to that virtualization architecture we talked about where you know, it was actually ideal to have a bunch of hypervisors talking to a share storage array, right? because that way you could do failovers. The problem with that is it, that becomes a scalability block, uh, bottleneck. So the way to get around that is to try, try to, do, to share as little as possible. Right? Try to use, um, a lot of, in a lot of cases, a lot of local storage and just replicate data across many different nodes. Right? And, that, and that way you're not bottlenecked there. Also, you want to do a message base where you, you don't have queues kind of, bottle, kind of stacking up and um, where, and that becomes the bottleneck. So in other words, you, what you want to do in your application architecture, and your infrastructure architecture as well, is to design in such a way that as many independent pieces are working at the same time. So that you no know, one, one or two processes have to always wait for another process to get completed before you can move on. And the key to doing that, it's basically the, the, all that stuff about scaling out versus, versus scaling up, building the share nothing message based architecture. The key is what we want to say is since the infrastructure is always going to fail, let's let the application handle, the, handle its own resiliency. So the idea is you want to build an architecture where you're using certain types of applications that will um, handle its own failover, that will handle its own replication. So a good example would be something like Cassandra, a Cassandra database, a NoSQL database uh, that, for example, Netflix uses. where the, uh, everything they do are spread out across multiple copies, across many, many, not only servers, but regions. So if a whole region fails, right, they just repoint, automatically repoint everything to that other region, and users don't even, for the most part, don't even know that something has happened. But for make, to make that happen, you need, a you need a cloud platform that can handle that type of multi-region scale-out architecture. And that's where something like CloudStack comes in. How many of you have heard of the CAP theorem? Okay, a few of you. So the uh, CAP theorem, also known as Brewer's theorem, is just basically the idea when you design architecture, distributed systems, let's say, you have three components, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. So consistency just means 
Every node in your system can see all the same data at the same time, this, right? Availability means um, when you make a request to any node, to the entire system, you're always gonna get a response one way or the other. And partition tolerance means if half the si part of the system fails, the system continues running. So Capdom says when you do a distributed architecture, which is what cloud native applications run on, you can't have all three, generally speaking. You're gonna have two, two out of three. And for the most part in a cloud world, we basically give up on consistency, right? We basically say we'll, we'll rather have the system running even if half of it fail, and we would rather have the data always available to, be, to either be read and also to be written to, and we'll just, we'll just assume eventual consistency, that eventually the application will make sure everything syncs up at some point. So a good example would be if you uh, if you use Amazon, right? Sometimes when you buy something, you may get, what, what you don't want to do with Amazon, you don't want to get a situation where when part of Amazon's infrastructure goes down, no one can get to anything. Right, you always want to get to the Amazon website to buy something. Also, you want to make sure that things are always available, <laughs> right? You make it so that you get, when you buy and buy a book, it either tells you, yes, the book exists, it's still in stock, or no, the book isn't. What, we tra what the trade-off is, you may get a situation where, let's say you only have one book in stock, and two different people buy, try to buy at the same time. Right, well, um, basically, this design is such a way that uh, at some point later, we'll tell you whether the book is there or not, but we're gonna let you get to, uh, we're gonna let you successfully make a request for the book, rather than, rather than and try to st stall everything so you can't even get to the, uh, the shopping cart. So again, in a cloud native world, these, that's the way you wanna design things for most likely, is to, to accept the idea of eventual consistency. And again, a lot of data, or the NoSQL databases, uh, use that as a, a design principle. So a couple of ways you can do cloud. So obviously cloud stack, um, it's a way to do a private cloud. And then comp uh, service providers like Exascale are providing a public cloud using cloud stack as their, uh, as their platform. So Anne's gonna talk about the reality, right? Still is, um, when I talk to enterprises particularly, you know, I talk to them about these cloudy apps and they come back and tell me, well, that's great, but 90% 90 of, 90 of my apps are legacy some of them running on Access, Microsoft Access, and DOS. So what should I do with them, <laughs> right? And, um, and we have a response, and Aaron's gonna talk about that. Yeah, so, um, and this is going to be very much in a cloud stack kind of context. Um, first of all, uh, again, what kind of workloads? What, what we've really said here is you've got two basic types of workloads, which I'm gonna go into here shortly, but but how do you start to classify those and what are some of the most common ones we see? Actually, today, if you're using existing applications and you're kind of cloudifying them, it's a lot of legacy applications. I'm not seeing, me personally, um, the majority is still legacy applications kind of getting into a cloud environment and then everyone is starting to re-architect for the future. And one of the keys around that is, is how are you gonna actually have an environment that both types of workloads and both type environments can be successfully managed under, <clears throat> excuse me, under one management platform. And that is where CloudStack is going to come into play here because you, you look at, you know, here's a, a, maybe a legacy VMware environment, if you will, and then th that's actually kind of the logical configuration of an OpenStack environment. And how do you get these two to work together? Um, in, in the OpenStack context, so to give you some information about all of that, you know, you've got KVM hypervisors across there, and then maybe you wanna take your VMware um, environment and put it under a vCenter environment so that you, you, you can kind of funnel everything up, if you will, to a centralized environment. But if you look at the CloudStack version, and that's what we're gonna go into here, is we, we create availability zones. So I'm gonna assume everyone here is, is you know, familiar with the concept of an availability zone. Um, but if you're not, uh, quick plug, I, I have a session, I think it's 1.10 this afternoon, somewhere in there. But it, I, I'm, my session is actually all of this at a deeper level. So I'm gonna go into these at a very low level and also do a, a, actually a demo, a lab demo for probably over half the session of how to set this up and how to match these infrastructure types and actually create this out. Um, but at the end of the day, 
you've got a, a basically your traditional application zone, and then you've got a cl cloud application zone. And if we take these and break them down a little further, so what are the differences? Again, we've talked about how the applications are different as far as that application is maybe set up for resiliency or not set up for resiliency, or it, it is able to scale out through sharding or eventual consisting, consistency in some of these other application type features, but your underlying infrastructure has to match. If your underlying infrastructure doesn't match, it, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. And so what we need to do is match the infrastructure to the application type. So in these traditional applications, typically you're gonna have some kind of management server, whether it's vCenter or Zen server kind of thing. You're gonna do enterprise class networking, typically layer two with VLANs is, is what we see most often. Um, if you're a service provider or service provider like or a very large enterprise, this is usually the first limit you hit. Um, 4,096 VLAN limit typically in, you know, in a domain. So, this is, this is one of the biggest reasons why I, people, I see people start to embrace concepts such as software-defined networking or actually rebuilding things as cloud-native applications. And then you don't have necessarily individual hypervisors. Your hypervisors are in a cluster and managed by this, this Zen Center or V Center kind of uh, environment. And then lastly, your storage is on enterprise class storage. You will typically put that on some kind of SAN. And then load balancing, firewall, VPN are all kind of wrapped around the edges of all of this, but not necessarily built into it. And so, if I look at the next type, again, matching application to infrastructure, vastly different kind of infrastructure. Instead of that networking being layer two VLANs, this is where a lot of times we're seeing software-defined networking, actually, this is the greatest adoption point. And, and you need things like, since you don't have layer two VLANs, you need to do security groups. You need to probably pop up to layer three and do security groupings to actually isolate everyone. And then you need EIP, elastic IPs, or ELB, elastic load balancers. So that, again, it's that dynamic scale-in, scale-out portion of this environment. This is where all of this happens. The network has to grow and shrink as you need in your application. And then a lot of times we see actually with this kind individual hypervisors or just bare metal a lot of times as well. And through automation and provisioning, uh, instead of clusters, we're seeing individual just servers. You know, it's, it again goes to the pets versus cattle. You know, these are the cattle, basically. And then the storage is very different a lot of times. This is where we're seeing a lot of the movement forward into object storage, whether it's Swift or S3 are the two, and then all of the different variants of them which are API compatible. So, you know, Ceph, Ink Tank, all of these guys. Now, that's great, but, oh, I thought there was one more slide. I apologize. Oops. <laughs> Oops. Whoops. I think we might have changed the slides. Um, so anyway, quick summary of all of that is, is, again, matching that infrastructure type to your application, but then also being able to centrally manage that within CloudStack. And again, um, quick summary of it. I'm going to do the session later this afternoon. I've got deeper slides on all of this. Some of those slides will be the same, but actually I would say stick around for the, for the demo of it. I have it entirely set up in a lab, and thank you, Gerilyn for Citrix allowing us to use the lab <laughs> that I'll be using for the demo this afternoon. Um, Ken, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I think we're running um, out of time. No, we'll just, I mean, we'll, I think we have a couple of minutes, so yeah. let's, uh, no, folks have questions. Here. Okay, what questions do y'all have about all of that? And sorry, and if you don't mind, is anybody actually doing something like this today? Because what I see in the majority of Cloud, Citrix Cloud Platform customers is one or the other. I don't necessarily see a lot of people going from one to the other or growing from one to the other. And so I kind of wanted to throw it out also, any questions, but also any feedback. Is anybody doing this? I, th I think Todd actually is in some way, shape, or form with his stuff that he's got kind of set up. He's got some cool things going, but, but anybody else very quickly? Questions, questions. Yes. About SDN deployments. Yes. Uh, so, as far as SDN deployments is concerned, what is the most common SDN uh, 
if, uh, architecture you see, or what's the most common SDN provider you see? Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the, with the SDN, we're kind of very much in the early stages of it, but from an SDN standpoint into cloud stack. Um, customers that I know of that I have seen is um, VMware's Nicira NSX. Um, we have some uh, Mitakura and uh, Juniper Open Contrail are the three primary ones that I've seen so far in, into Cloud Stack specifically. Any deployments of uh, these SDN providers? Um, Production deployments, I guess? Uh, I'm sorry? Me personally, no, I have not. So, uh, you know, that was, I was at Citrix and I kind of did the front end and other people were doing the back end of it. I, I did not personally know. But I can get you in touch with people if you would like to talk to them. <laughs> what other questions do you have? This is all makes sense. I think, um, I think we're getting, I think whether it's, again, whichever cloud platform you're using, um, I think, you know, one of the things I talk a lot with um, analysts about is this idea that I think we're kind of through the early stage adoption of, of cloud platforms where people are willing to say, I'm just, everything's greenfield. And we're starting to get to that point where we're getting to the sort of the enterprise, the, what they call the early, late adopters or early majority people who are like, I want to look into cloud stack, let's say, but I have all these legacy stuff that I need to know what to do with. And I want to know, should I just put, can I just put it all over the cloud stack? And if I do that, how do I go about doing that? So until we can, satis until we can satisfactorily answer those questions, we're, we're not, you're not going to get very broad adoption of cloud stack, and that, at least not in the enterprise. So it's important for all, for all of you who are in the cloud stack world, if you want to break into, the, into that next level where, where most of the uh, customers are, right, you need to be able to give them that story to say, whatever your workload is, right, there's a way to run that and have a cloud stack manage it uh, so that um, it's, a, it's a viable solution. Any quick, we've got one minute. We've been given the flag here. Any last questions? Very cool. We'll be around afterwards. Thank you very much. Yep.